All right, uh, hopefully this is working correctly. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah, it looks like people are filing in, so that, that should be good. So I'll just go ahead and start. Uh, hey there, Laker fans. Welcome to uh, Lakers Detailed. I'm your host, Vinay, with my co-host, Raj. And uh, the Lakers get swept on the season by the Sacramento Kings. We lose yet another crucial must-win for the jumping up in the standings game. And uh, it doesn't happen in a very good way. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna just kind of jump into it. Uh, I, you know, we'll do small talk. I'm sure we'll interject it here as we go. But Raj, give me sort of like your in, just just give me your initial feeling. Give me your initial feeling uh, of, of of how you feel about the, the end result of this game. It it's just crushing for like every must win game to fall flat on your face, and I feel like this is must win number. 15 that we've been in just this cycle of must win games that you know everyone beforehand has all the narratives and the stories kind of to a line right and uh everything kind of lined up for this to be the specific one sacramento's eight on this um second game of second night of a back-to-back the lakers had two days off in a to not just rest because obviously that's important for our stars but also to game plan against a sacramento team that you just played a week ago, um, right? They also have their starting wing out and Kevin Herter, who they replaced with Keon Ellis, who who played really well. But uh, yeah, and yeah, to fall flat in the Sabonis versus AD storyline, which I honestly thought was just a tad overplayed in terms of its one on one type of nature. But uh, AD definitely did not look comfortable again against Sabonis. So all those kind of things circling around <laughs> um, the Lakers and the backdrop, obviously, is a just terribly timed D'Angelo Russell, uh, you know, hit piece that that comes out today. So that that's what I'm feeling, Vinay. It's just extremely annoying for like all these games to continue to pile up. That um, you lose the must win. Like tonight was a big one for standings watch, and uh, this has been like the third straight. This is the fourth straight loss to Sacramento. This third straight blowout blowout against the Kings, and we'll we'll get into the matchup because I think Sacramento does pose some specific problems, but. Um, yeah, you just you just come out like LeBron had a nice fourth, but I thought he was very just uh, disengaged offensively. I thought AD again was taken out of this game, and that's the disappointing part. So I think Fox had like eight points going into halftime. They weren't playing, you know, particularly well. Uh, but this has kind of been the story of the season, Vinay. Like these uh, big games, we get trounced in, and then everyone just moves on to. Uh, blame the coach or blame whoever for you know whatever I think you titled this. Let's play the blame game, and I think that's oh yeah, what, this yeah, that's just to get. I think that's, that's what people on. are about that's to. I think that's. Yeah. I, I think that's what people are about to do. So uh, let's uh yeah. let's let's get playing. I guess. Yeah. So let, let's get the ugly part out of the way. The timing of that article and the sensational nature of that article uh, by Dave McMenamin on ESPN, which mind you. Four minutes into the game, there's a TV timeout or there's a timeout. And the very first thing, George Sedano, these guys are doing their job, so I'm not, I'm not blaming them specifically. But the very first timeout, they referenced the article. And I was just like, oh, all right, we're, we're not even going to like wait till halftime to discuss this. We're just, this is going to be the first thing that we discuss. We're not going to talk about Austin Reeves going off for 11 points, like basically outscoring the Kings to start the game. <laughs> we're going to go right into this article. So, okay, ESPN, that's their job. That's, you know, they're, their job is to, you know, push monetizable content. And so that was really, really nice job that they did today. Um, and obviously the ugly part is Dilo did not have a good game. Uh, the guy that you mentioned that was playing against him, Keon Ellis, actually had a better game. And I would say there were times where Keon did a really, really good job uh, against him defensively. Um, and, you know, like I tweeted it out earlier, uh, I'd love to troll. Like if I cared about winning arguments against complete strangers, I would just go up and down my timeline and just keep trolling about how bad Dilo played. But I actually really want us to win these games. Like <laughs> this was a huge game for us to win just because we make up ground, you know, like to, to get to that seventh and eighth, eighth spot. And, you know, like I, there's Laker fans that are doing the standings watch respect, rightfully so, because they, they want this team to also get seventh and eighth. Um, so we get two shots in the play in, but we just keep dropping these games. And I thought today was one of those days where it wasn't just one player, you know, D'Lo had a bad game, but I thought, you know, D'Lo, Braun and AD for three quarters played really bad basketball. Um, I don't think they were consistent. Oh, I would say the defense was there. Like I, I feel like the Lakers did a much better job 
containing Fox and Monk. Um, a lot of times they were very good on communication. They would just hand Fox off or Monk off to AD and then Austin Reeves or some or Rui or somebody would go and crash. You know, they would kind of help gang rebound and stuff like that against the bonus. So I thought there was some stuff that they did well. Um, sure. But we got, Raj, we got nothing. We got nothing out of the three guys out of uh, on our team that, that we needed. And I don't really know where to start because there's many different places we can start. Delo is obviously the easiest person to pick on because of the article. But you you tell me, which which player do you want to discuss? Because I think there's three different points of yeah, we, Go for it. We can get into Delo because Delo will kind of merge into the article conversation so we can get yes. to that. I think LeBron is just his own kind of universe where you have to kind yes. of – tiptoe around the way you speak ad versus sabonis man let's get into that because i think yes. i think that's i think i think that's the matchup of today right and you know ad was asked earlier i think by dave from minimum about uh your 0 and 9 against the bonus which Vinay, by the way is an insane question that's a yes. twitter conversation that made it somehow to the lakers floor but in any case it was a, a Sabon ad is now 0 and 9 against the bonus um in head-to-head matchups and i thought you know that and ad was asked about it and ad answered it how ad does very nonchalant very you know passive kind of just throwing it off his shoulder um but that game started i thought he, um ad was in his head like just was not comfortable offensively sabonis does this thing Vinay, where he pushes ad i think 100 like foot, far, foot farther than he wants to catch it every single time that little this is it's a, this is a little, great observation because i haven't seen a single person say it and you're you're, you're saying it so please Elaborate exactly yeah. on what he's doing. Yeah, so like people are begging, go go at him in the post, right? So when AD turns to catch the basketball, Sabonis is just a little bit more physical, and he pushes AD to catch it a foot outside. And AD wants no part of the ball. Like when you catch it in the post, right, what AD likes to do is to face up, right, and get into a triple threat. Against guys bigger than him, the way to beat them is with speed and with handle. But if AD is triple threat, like in his triple threat position at the three-point line, it's not as much of a threat because Simonis can then back off and kind of wait for him to come to him. It just pushes AD farther, which is why he'll flow into a dribble handoff. And I think Simonis does that so much throughout the game. And he also does it on the boards. You'll see Simonis get a bunch of offensive rebounds um, where he kind of pushes AD out the way. Little bumps, little bruises here. Those things add up. And I think like we kind of throw away, Vinay, what the player says all the time. And these player podcasts have not helped that actually, but like we throw away what the players say. And Anthony Davis has been like pretty, you know, uh, transparent that I don't want to play center I, like all game play. I don't want to have the bumps and bruises all game. And Sabonis, uh, as like he was kind of billed as this power, you know, power forward, but he's physical, like he's big, he wants to get into you. Like his game is to go through your chest, it's not a lot of finesse, it's a lot of tough kind of moves. And, um, but like. Tell me where at, where you're at, because I think I think Sabonis is a real like uh, like his build and like the way he play ba- he plays basketball. That's a tough uh, matchup for AD to line up against, and these aren't excuses for him. I think AD has to be better. His floor has to be higher, but there's definitely something there where that archetype of guy, this big bruising guy who play makes and can go through AD's chest, it gives him problems, man, and that's an issue. This Kings game was a must win. I think like people can say what they want. I think the Lakers knew that this is one that you had to have. And there was yeah. a little bit of a playoff style to it. This felt very conference finals Eve in a bad way with like the D'Lo performances and all that. But um, yeah, I think Simonis gives him issues, man. But but talk to me. Where are you at with that matchup? Because I think I think that's where you have to start with this. The two big Simonis finishes with like 16, 11, and 10. And AD eventually gets to his 20 in kind of garbage minutes. But um, what would you see from the, from those two? He- that okay, and to say it nicely, like AD, like has to like stomp on on Sabonis, like like the way Draymond did or something like that. Like at some <laughs> point, he has to fight back against the physicality because this entire game, Raj, it's not even when he's trying to catch it on the entry pass. Even when he's going to set a screen, rewatch him going to set screens for Austin or Delo. Sabonis is walking up to him and literally just pushing him with one hand. And pushing it, yeah. making even that screen like to mess up the timing, or even push that screen farther away, so that Sabonis has more room to defend that play, and and AD can't get as clean of a you know like a direct line uh, rim run uh, after the screen. Every it is very clear that the Sacramento game plan for Anthony Davis is every single chance you get, you put your, you put a body on him or you put your hands on him one way or another. If there's one thing that he doesn't 
it's not just the physicality. It's the frequency of the physicality, right? So it's not mm -hmm. like Sabonis is doing it to him only when he gets right. post-ups or only when he's boxing out. Every single possession, every single time uh, AD is on the floor, he has to feel every single player that's on there. He gets in the poach, sorry, in the coast, sorry, in the post, <laughs> there's going to be, there's going to be two sacrament. Like he's going to get defended by Sabonis or Alex Len and Malik Monk or somebody's going to come over and dig, dig out his dribble in, in, in the post. He wants to go set a screen for his teammate. No, we're going to push you and we're going to make, we're going to force the refs to, to either make a call or, or not make a call. And tonight they're not really making calls like that. Honestly, like they, they, they're not mm -hmm. calling a lot of plays like that. And then on the other end, if, if Sabonis gets the ball, you have to collide with them, what, two, three, four, five times. And even if you don't shoot the ball, just, just uh, you know, body him. Like, there were some times where I thought Sabonis, like, AD, like, stymied him. Like, he took away the left hand, and Sabonis had to turn around and look for another teammate. But by that time, he had already, you know, wrestled with AD for at least a solid two, three seconds. That stuff, take you know, it, it, there's, a, there's wear and tear that happens on AD then. And it's just like, it's the game of attrition. Sacramento plays the game of attrition against Anthony Davis better than any other team I have ever seen. Maybe, maybe Denver because of, because of Jokic and, and what they do with Aaron Gordon. I think they do it better against Braun than, than any other team in the league because of Aaron Gordon. But AD specifically, I don't think anybody plays the game of attrition uh, against AD better than the Kings do. I don't think the Lakers, he has to eventually turn the corner. Sabonis so can't win this matchup the way that he has. They have no shot of winning uh, against the Kings if that's what's going to continue happening. Yeah. Over. So, so here's my my counter question to you. So Sabonis so isn't on him all night. So like, why do you think when Harrison Barnes is on him or when Keegan Murray is switched on him, the confidence to be an offensive threat still isn't there, right? Like he's still just not being super aggressive. He's not getting to the line. I always say the barometer for AD is free throws and offensive rebounds. He had three offensive rebounds, but I, I think only like four became offensive second, uh, second chance points. Um, he had six free throws on the night, which again, I just didn't think he put his stamp on the game, but you're right. Like there, this matchup can't be so lopsided. I think for AD, the way he sees it is I have so much to cover for, right? Like defensively, I have so much on my plate. I have to not only cover Sabonis, I have two guards who 100% can't guard their matchup, right? Like Reeves and uh, D'Lo just can't guard Monk and Fox. Like, I don't even, Vinay, I don't even think De'Aaron Fox saw his defender tonight. Like, I just, right. I don't think he did. Every shot looked easy. Nothing looked forced. Looked like everything was super comfortable. Malik Monk, I think, had three fouls. But even for him, I thought he was able to kind of get wherever he wanted on the floor. And I think AD sees all that. And it's like, I also can't set every screen hard. I also can't, you know, be super physical um, down low with Sabonis. And I'm not sure how you kind of fix that, I guess. I, I don't know what the answer is to that. I, I think everyone knew this was a big game. And and yet you saw that Sacramento has played us the exact same way three straight exactly. times. The first, game, the first game, there was a little bit of, like, <clears throat> chaos. It was still new, regular season. Gabe Vincent was in the rotation at that time, who was kind of our um, – our defender for De'Aaron Fox, but these last three have all been the exact same. Sabonis so goes through 80's chest, and 80's like, "There's no one helping me on the boards, and I'm not about to just take a pounding every single time." You just talked about the the war of attrition. Sabonis so is super physical from tip from the tip off. He's super physical, and 80 just doesn't respond well to that. Um, but what's what's your counter, I guess, when to that? What is this just on 80 to be more? Uh, physical to respond phys to physicality with physicality is this something where you play a center next to him jackson hayes minutes versus sabonis tonight were god awful they were terrible yeah. they were a disaster so i don't i don't think that's the answer but <clears throat> I, I, I would have liked to see Rui or lebron Vinay on sabonis like that was a counter i would have liked to see uh, sabonis is involved in, in so many ball screens that it's tough to kind of trust those like Rui, especially in just those decision making i just they're, the way that Sacramento pierces your defense is a lot of times Sabonis just backing his guy down. You draw two and it's hell, right? So, yeah. uh, Sacramento spacing is so beautiful that like once you have two and one spot on the floor, they're going to find an open shot. It's just a matter of when, right? It's not an if, it's a matter of when. And I would just love to keep Sabonis as a, more of a single coverage. But what, what was the counter to that? Is this just, let's start blame game number one. Is this game just on AD for not 
you know, uh, rising to the occasion here? Or, like, or is this just a specific matchup that he really is just is a kind of uh, internal issue with him that he just cannot get his game off against against Sabonis and Jokic and Zubac and Nurkic and these, like, big bruising bruising centers? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think your observation is right. Like, the, obviously, this this situation is about the Kings and Sabonis, but this is this is a straight-up archetype that that ad has trouble with and it's not re- like he, he can't defend guys like that like he's not able to defend the Nurkic's, the Sabonis's, um and and you know the Jokic's. and it's funny because they're all european guys but it, that, that you know it's not on purpose that's just right. literally who he has trouble with even even zubak sometimes he has trouble with mm-hmm. uh to some degrees and drum in right I don't, as well yeah yeah I, I i don't necessarily know what the answer to that is because there's always two ways to go about it, right? Like there's there's a version of this where you play bigger, like way bigger, and you play like, you know, you know, LeBron and Rui already play together. Maybe there's a version where you also play Vando. But the issue with a team like the Kings is they have enough speed where they can run you off the floor even if you play bigger. Like for the folk, like last last um, what's it called uh, in, in the playoffs last year, they lost in the first round to the, to the Warriors. But their counter to everything that the Warriors were doing was to go even smaller and go even faster. And I think that's what extended the series. I think they won game five in Golden State. or they, No, they won game six or something like that like uh, in Golden State. And then Steph, I think, went crazy in game seven. I, I forgot right. exactly mm-hmm. how many games were left. But that has always been the counter for what Sacramento wants to do. That's what they did to us the last game. We were beating them up in the first quarter. And then that second unit that came in said, okay, we're going to play as fast as possible. And we're not going to give you a chance to set up your defense. And if you do set up your defense, we're gonna we're like we're gonna make it so that it's it's basically a two on one. Like Sabonis so is gonna wipe out the guy who's guarding Monk or Fox, and you're gonna have to play him straight up. And and you know they, they get to take these mid range shots. I don't know what the answer to that is. The Lakers did some different stuff today. Like they had LeBron kind of coming from the corner to like kind of hedge that play and then recover back. Um, but you know we don't have to get into him right now. But like okay, Braun is also a thousand years old. He's not going to do that like every single position. It's not the playoffs yet. I don't think he's going to do the regular season. I think he was under the weather today, but like you saw what happens when Braun isn't, if you're asking Braun to be the guy to do that, Harrison Barnes is getting wide open threes. Like the rotations aren't crisp enough for this to work the way it has to. And you've also pointed out the thing that you were going to say. Rui, you'd want Rui on Sabonis, but then that opens up the door to Fox and Monk ISOs against Rui, and we know we're not going to win yeah. that just because those guys are just way too talented. Rui, Rui's not quite there. Uh, de- you know, he's not up there uh, defensively. So it's like, does Vando help this matchup? Like, you know, you have D'Lo, Braun, AD, Austin. Maybe Vando makes more sense, you know, against a team like this where you have a dedicated defender on a guy like Fox and a guy like Monk. Um, and then he's, hand, you know, you can hand him off to AD. And Vando's still a pretty good uh, rebounder that, that he, you know, he can battle a little bit with Sabonis and stuff like that on a rebound. I don't know if that's the solution. I don't want to say that's the solution, but that's a functional issue. That's why I keep saying, like, there's a functional issue. There's a style of play that the Lakers play and want to play and defend offensively, defensively, that the Kings are just, like, their way of playing is much better than ours. And that style of play is very hard for us to deal with because – Sabonis is so physical. If Anthony Davis can't win the physicality battle, or if he can't just win the one-on-one battle, okay? Like, let's forget the physicality yeah. part. If he can't win the one-on-one battle, command a double team the way that we would expect him to, dominate the paint, that sort of thing, just on the offensive end, it's not going to yeah. happen for us the other way. That's the problem. We can't trade buckets with this team. We have to dominate this team in in, in one specific uh, area. Go for it. So the Kings, when they are 20th in defense, right? Like this is not a... This is not a great defensive team at all. Rui and Austin, I think, combined for 40-plus in the first half. First half, yeah. Yeah, so they kind of carried you through, right? They kind of kept you in it, kept your head above water. I think we had the lead, or maybe we were down to um, at halftime. I forgot what it was. We scored 17 points in the third quarter. Like, that's where the game got away. Yep. Third quarter started. I think the Kings went on a 12-0 run. And they kind of kept that kept us at that, you know, double digit margin for the rest of the game. That's like that should be the portion where LeBron and AD come in, you know, be like, look, we haven't played well. Second half is starting. 
LeBron, I think at the time had four shots, AD, I think was like two for eight. Like that should be the portion of the game. I'm going to carry us through. And instead we lost the lead. And I think that's, um, that's troubling. That's like disheartening as much as like we, we go through the X and, X and O's, like your stars have to be able to create good offense cons consistently. Like that should be something that your stars should be able to do at least draw two. And I thought the shots we were getting, um, we just really struggled getting any type of open looks. And a lot of that, I thought we were trying to force AD the basketball. D'Lo obviously just was not prepared for the ball pressure for some reason of Keon Ellis and, and Davion Mitchell, but our stars just could not get it going. And that's something that I think we have to figure out. There's enough in a big bruising centers in the West to where that's a concern, no matter who you play against. Um, and no matter what type of West matchup you get, there's going to be a big bruising guy. And, like we've we've talked about AD so much. This is year six of AD. Like we've kind of psychoanalyzed him enough, and um, I think with him, it just all again falls back into the like he just lost all confidence in any jump shot and any shot outside the paint. And when you do that, like you lose your ball handling, you lose like your confidence at the free throw line. Um, he was taking free throw again. He's taking our technical foul shots, which I don't know what that says about our team, but um. He's like, he's yeah. just losing all, he's lost all confidence. And even when it is Harrison Barnes, but then he's catching it. And you talked about how Sacramento digs down every time they also switch up their coverages. So mm -hmm. like Mike Brown's very good, very good at this. But um, every time AD catches it, sometimes they come on the first dribble. Sometimes Benet, they come on the third dribble and, you yeah. know, like they mix up their coverages to where he's never comfortable. Um, And these good defenses are going to do that to him. Uh, Draymond does similar things with AD. He kind of plays little, games to where like sometimes he'll contest sometimes he'll rip down sometimes he'll keep his hands high and that's what kind of good defenses do um and the kings aren't even one of those they just kind of keep him guessing so if lebron lebron got it going in the second half but um like yeah like your 80s got to be able to create one-on-one -on -one, right at least one-on-one -on -one in that matchup you got to be able to yeah. go by get Simonis in top some type of foul trouble make Simonis defend in space in some way and i think Simonis just gets to sit in his little rocking chair of an a and wait for ad to come to him every single time and it's it's a very deep easy defensive kind of uh position for him to be in but um yeah that that's where i'm at with this game though i just i, I thought you know ad just was not he was missing dunks he was missing layups at the rim was, yeah you could tell he was just mentally um kind of uh taken back by you know this matchup and it's been it's four straight games like we've, yeah. we've lost this way i don't i don't know but th this is something that has to be um something has to be figured out for sure yeah, and I'm, I'm like I said, you know, like the 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 reason why it's this game is always funny because is because the article that came out today was about Darwin. Like there was like a part portion in that article where they talked about the film room session with Darwin, and I guess one of the things that that the coach had said was, you know, like sometimes we got to play with better effort. We have to clean up our execution, and the pushback was, you know, it was it was presented as like. D'Lo pushed back on Darvin, um, or it wasn't in the film room, it was about the Miami game. And if you guys remember, that Miami game was another game where the Heat played more physical than the Lakers did. They jumped on every 50-50 ball. They played faster. Mm. They played with more confidence. Like, that was just a game, I think, if I remember correctly, we were all upset that we lost because we're like, they don't got, they don't have Jimmy. We shouldn't lose yeah. this game. We had LeBron and AD. Uh, mm -hmm. It was like, bam, and then everybody was upset at, you know, uh, they were uh, upset at your guy, JHS, because Jaime Hawkins went and hit the Kobe <laughs> fade on Braun towards the end of the game or something like that. And so, um, yeah. like, that, the way that it was written in that article was about, like, oh, well, the challenge back was, well, your schemes have to be better. It's not about effort. This game wasn't lost on schemes. This game was lost on effort. Like, there, that last game that we played Sacramento, when we were just playing drop and watching these guys just take uncontested jumpers in the mid-range, that there's a scheme issue. There's a little bit of effort issue in, in regards to that. But today wasn't a scheme issue. I thought they were doing a pretty good job scheme wise, keeping guys like Fox and Monk from getting loose. Monk actually got in foul trouble and he was out of the game. But then yep. we couldn't score the basketball, the guys that we expect to score. That's effort. I don't think there was anything schematically that was done to, you know, you mentioned some of the small things that they do to AD to keep him off balance so his reads aren't consistent. I don't think they did anything crazy against Braun. I don't think they did anything crazy against D'Lo. They were just, I mean, they, Rod, the third quarter, I, I, I want to say like Braun and D'Lo were both just throwing the ball away. They were like just passing mm -hmm. it to Kings players constantly. And that was part of the reason why we only had 17 points to, to begin with. It's like they would drive to the rim 
And then they try to make an interior pass in between like two or three Kings players for some reason, instead of just taking the shot, maybe because they didn't feel comfortable, you know, shooting the ball themselves. But that's execution, dude. That's effort. Like Harrison Barnes, there's a play, I think in the fourth quarter when the Lakers are trying to make a run, you might remember this. Braun is in the, is guarding the left wing. Austin Reeves is, I want to say on Keegan Murray. I forgot who he was guarding. Or he, he, no, he might've been on Chris Duarte or something like that. And Harrison Barnes is in the corner. Braun is guarding Harrison Barnes. And Austin Reeves is following Chris Doherty or whoever it is. He's following him across the paint, behind AD. So bonus is, has that at the top of the key. And Austin points, looking at Braun, saying, you've got to pick him up because what's it called? Like, like I have to go back to my spot. Braun doesn't move. Like, he's just standing there in that spot. And Harrison Barnes has already cut all the way up to the wing. And, like, Austin... If you rewatch that play, it makes it look like Austin didn't know what he was doing. But the reality was that he was expecting his teammate to, you know, get past, he was expecting to pass on the coverage. Austin run back, runs back, Harrison Barnes gets a wide open three and he drains it. And there are so many possessions this game where the execution is just bad. Like I'm watching yeah. two, three guys rotate and the fourth guy doesn't want to rotate. And I'm not going to say like it wasn't always Braun or it wasn't always a specific person. But a team like Sacramento, a team like OKC, a team like the Warriors, a team like Denver, all of these teams see the same thing on tape. Who is it on the Lakers that's not rotating? That's who they want to target. And a lot of times we think to ourselves, it's just like, oh, it's just because we can't contain a guy at point of attack. Dude, the NBA is a very talented league. Oh, there's a lot of guys that can't contain anybody at the point of attack. Like this is not like team defense the Lakers, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like we've seen Sacramento go and torch a whole bunch of other teams that actually have good defenders uh, on the backcourt, but that's not the way. That's not the game they're playing. The game they're playing is how do we get the best open shot for our team? And for them, so many times today, it felt like it was just like, oh, the Lakers made two threes. Watch this. We're just going to run this play two or three times in a row and watch us generate an open three because we know that somebody's not going to rotate or they're not going to run back on time. That we cannot beat this team unless everything is lined up correctly. They are too good offensively to do that. And yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what what direction you want to take it. We talked about AD. I'll ask you a question before, and so, so that we can segue to kind of the next thing. Should Braun have played this game today? Like he, I think he was under the weather. It seemed like the shoot around. Should he have played this game today? Like I, I know you want him to play, and if he wants to play, he's going to play. But we watched the first three quarters of this game. He was. Not typical Braun, uh, that that you would expect in 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 the in, in this scenario. Should he have played this game? That that's my question. To yeah, you. that's yeah, that's tough. I, I think he should have. Like I I think you had absolutely no chance. Even with LeBron kind of lollygagging in some of you know these scenarios, I think you just needed someone big with size out there just to kind of uh, disrupt some of the drives that the that the Kings were doing. But yeah, those first three quarters were. Um, we needed more, especially offensively. I think LeBron had what, like six points at, you know, halftime or, you know, uh, through, um, the first three quarters. I don't even think he had nine points. He got double figures in the, in the fourth quarter. And I think LeBron had like 12 shots. And so Vinay, I want to touch on something. You said it's all effort. And I do think effort is, is definitely a part of it. And like, I, Darvin Ham is just going to continue to get, you know, just destroyed as, as the games continue to, to continue uh, yeah. to go on here. Um, but I do think like, what Sacramento does impacts our effort as well. You know what I mean? Like, so like their play kind of impacts how our effort levels kind of wax and wane. What I mean by that, um, their speed just kills and their speed yes. is, um, their speed is demoralizing. You know what I mean? Like the type of speed they are. So I remember a play where I think, cause Austin had it going, he had 13 points in the first quarter. Austin comes off a of pick and roll. And I think he gets a switch. It's a step back three. I think over Alex Len is who he hits a step back three for. Mm. But hey, I swear they Sacramento comes down the other end. Keegan Murray curls flying off a of pin down. They're not even the ball's not even cross half court yet. Keegan Murray's curling into a three and just drills yeah. it and completely negates Austin's three. I'm like, that's just, that's that must be um extremely tough to kind of go against. And that's just consistent. Sacramento, in my opinion, can like creates the best shots consistently, like throughout a whole game. Like they just don't stop. Fox, Monk, Sabonis, they have so many ways to pierce your defense. Um, they do it in a way that, for our team, it's just not a team you want to go against in the regular season. I'm sure they were up for it to start, but once they just saw 
the threes flying in. I think it just um, demoralized, you know, as their play. It's not an excuse. I just want to watch this team play the Kings. We were up 19, Renee, last game. Up 19. Sacramento throws in their speed lineup that you just you mentioned. They're yeah. throwing Monk, Davion Mitchell, and I forgot who the third. I think Keon Ellis is the third guard. Uh, yeah. Davion Mitchell hits, I think, two straight threes, and then Monk comes come, Monk comes off, hits a three. And I think Sacramento cuts the lead to, like, nine. And you could just see the Lakers' faces, like, oh, shit. Like, and they're still up nine, but, like, you could yeah. see the, like, the the belief kind of leave their soul. And um, I've seen that. I've seen that too consistently. So should LeBron have played? I think he should have. I think this needed to be a game where you had two days off before this game, but now you have two days off after this game. Um, by the way, I'll be in the building for Lakers Warriors. So I'm just I'm going to that. So yeah, hopefully so see Steph see, Curry. Go to play. the building, find Raj and harass him and ask him yes. why Darwin is it? Uh why Darwin Ham <laughs> wants to play drop coverage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so tonight you were talking about the execution. I thought like our mo- our coverages were okay. Like we try to yeah. switch a little bit more. I thought like we had some good switches. We had Rui on like Fox and Monk sometimes, but I thought like we forced them into long twos. First half defense was okay. Like I, I thought yeah, like, I agree. in my head, I was like, you get LeBron and AD into the scoring margin. You have a real big shot in this third quarter. You're up two or down two. I forgot. You played Sacramento pretty well. I think Fox had like eight points. Monk wasn't really going. Keon Ellis hit a few threes, but you kind of live with those shots. Sabonis was hitting, was taking jump shots. I thought like the flow was correct until that third quarter. Um, So needed more from LeBron, needed more from AD. And uh, needed D'Lo to fly to Sacramento, I guess, because I'm not <laughs> sure he was not sure he was there. But um, yeah, that was a uh, okay, that was, that yeah, was a rough one, rough one to watch. Yeah, so you know, AD AD gets dominated physically. Um, that has been a consistent story. You know, Bron, I, like I said, I, I think he was under the weather because based on that shoot around interview, it looked like uh, I think Yovan reported that he was sick, like sick, sick, uh, not yeah. like um, allergy sick, and so. Uh, he might have been Before under we, the weather. We move on real, yeah, real quick. On. I just want to ask you real quick. In 2020, was this happening? Like, was AD getting dominated by big physical center? I just, I don't remember that. It, no. Maybe because that year was just, like, in terms of how the, the the result was, that we kind of forget some of the process things that went by. I just, I remember he would struggle against the Clippers sometimes. Like, he mm-hmm. had fourth quarter offensive woes against them. Denver, I don't really remember him having a tough time scoring against Denver. But um, I just... So if- so if I can if yeah. I can rem- remember what the tone so that year that we won the championship, um, the the specific thing that was happening was in the first quarter we couldn't score, but we could defend. Yes, and we were so we really really JaVale. great. Yeah, because we started Javale, and you know obviously the limitations were there because AD's jump shot wasn't quite there uh, the way that we needed it to be uh, until obviously the bubble and then that's that's history. Um, and you know you had Braun at the three. Different Braun, much more spry, you know, physically he was, he was, he was much better, you know, closer to the super dominant version of what he is. Uh, but we would still have first quarters where we couldn't score. There wasn't sp- spacing. People would be very upset about that. All that, that was, that was the time where we used to yell at KCP after every game. Cause he'd miss all the wide open threes. And that was like, you know, we felt that that was the difference between us being successful and us not being a successful offense. Again, role player getting blamed when your star players can't score. Always a fascinating thing to me. But you know, we'll we'll continue going. But that was what was the, what that's what it was. We would have mm-hmm. two bigs. We would have Javale and Dwight. Then eventually we had Marcus Sol and Andre Drummond. Um, and then obviously we brought Dwight back, and that experiment was over within two days. Uh, within two games, um, that there was a trade off to that. Like we couldn't score. We didn't have space to score. We didn't have the shooting because we had three guys who were not really floor spacers in that sense with Braun AD and whoever the center was, that was what that was. And we've had to move away from that because AD still hasn't become as consistent of a jump shooter as we'd like him to be uh, the way that he was in, in the bubble. And I think Braun had a rough three point shooting year last year, but this year he's been really good actually from, from the three. So I, he's actually yeah. helping us out. But now we've run into this thing where our second or our first best offensive player isn't actually able to spread the floor for us the way that we want to. So what's happened? We've we put him at center and we've leaned into it. We said, okay, you have to play center and we're going to feed it to you as long as you get it, you know, to your favorite, you get to your favorite spots. So now what happens is that we run into teams that know that if you don't let AD get to his favorite spots, you can take him out of his game. That's what Sacramento is doing to us. That's what 
Denver does to us. That's what Minnesota tries to do to us. That's what all these teams with with big physical players, um, Clippers try to do that too as well. They 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 try to then you get the double teams that sort of thing. So the issue here is we don't have okay. First and foremost, finding a center who can spread the space the floor for you is damn near impossible in the NBA right now. Like you, you're not going to find a guy who's right Nikola Vucevic shooting ability, but I can also defend the rim the same way Dwight and Javale did. You know what I mean? Like, like in that capacity, yeah. you're not, no Brook Lopez is really available, that sort of thing. So that we are just trying to navigate what that is, whatever that impasse looks like. That's what we're trying to navigate. That's why like taking Torian out and putting Rui in and everybody's <laughs> patting themselves on the shoulders. Like, Oh, see, we're so we're smarter than him. Cause we did it. We know that like every, I, I think even ham to some degree knows that obviously he has his allegiances. That's why he's going to play who he's going to play. I don't know why he plays Torian Prince so much. But like playing bigger always worked in our favor, but there was always a trade-off. Rui can't switch out onto the perimeters. He's a worse defender than Braun in terms of like against super fast and speedy guys. Braun's actually really good when he's like locked in, locked into the game, and so so is AD. So it's like we're trying to navigate this, but there's there are clearly teams that can expose that specific flaw with AD that doesn't require them to have to send extra people. And like I said, right. dude, like the Kings are the only team I've seen. The Kings are the only team I've seen this season that have AD scouted out to like that level of detail. Yeah. I, I think it's them. I think the Clippers do a good job. They're very um, yeah. like specific in terms of where they send their doubles from. Jokic just has AD's number. And I think Jokic is the one that most fans, when they give a pass for, like yeah, we get it. MVP, Jokic is so, yeah. MVP is a behemoth, like huge dude, right? They're not really in the same weight class. Like Jokic yeah. is just a lot bigger. I think Sabonis was one though that like you can you can understand why fans are just not gonna accept that. And I try to like and like you actually go down the rabbit hole with people and I like just watch them go down it themselves. I don't even involve I don't even like involve myself. Um, but like I try to at least like speak from a basketball perspective where look. Sabonis is just more physical. And these are crazy things to say about a guy who's about to make All-NBA second team, whatever, that AD is going to make. I don't remember if AD started the All-Star game or not, but uh, he was definitely an All-Star. Um, like, it's just things that are tough to say about a player like Sabonis who averages like 20 and 12 on a, you know, a, a Sacramento team that a lot of teams just don't respect in title contention. But, like, these guys do give him issues. They're more physical. They're bigger. And, like, he's really, like, having a tough time and I, this is a Laker thing too, Vinay, to me. Like, I think when teams turn up their ball pressure, right? Like, just turn up their defensive intensity. We curl, like, into a fetal position way too many times. And, sure. like, it, it's funny. We're going to talk about the D-Lo story here eventually. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a coincidence that, like, our two – I'm not going to say this politely. Our, like, two best role players – who are most comfortable with physicality had the best games today. Like I think Rui yeah. is a guy that very much accepts physicality. I think Austin too is also a guy that like is very much accepting of physicality and is willing to dish it out. Um, and even like on defense, Austin is way more willing to kind of get, get into you even if like he lets people blow by them. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think guys like Keon, Keon Ellis, Davion Mitchell, like those are, <laughs> those are ball pressure guards that give, <laughs> some of our guards issues but um being, i think that's a Laker. so nice you're being so nice uh, well, this I'm, topic. I, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. i'm just no i'm just like because i've seen this happen very many times where like teams teams like sacramento the only way they can kind of like, because they just don't have a lot of size on the floor the way that you do that is you let people enter your arena right their arena is speed they're like play our game and so like we get baited into it like I remember we were, I was watching the first half and I was like, this pace is good. It's slow. It's my, yeah. it's like, um, uh, it's methodical, right? You want to, you know, go and run your stuff. We get one outlet that works and we're like, boom, let's go. We're throwing like three straight outlet passes and it's like turnover Keon Ellis three turnover Fox layup. It's like, you can't play their game. Yes. And, um, but Sacramento baits you into that with their ball pressure. They want to speed you up those like digs into AD. What that is, is make AD's processing speed faster, make him have to yes. make decisions at a quick rate. And they've done that very well. The Clippers do this too. The Clippers are a little different in how they operate, but, um, yeah, like Sacramento is just really, really good at like speeding a game up and they do that to us. But it's weird. Like you watch a team like Chicago, Vinay, 
like DeRozan just plays his pace and he he dice the Kings up because the Kings can't speed him up. And like that's the he was he dropped, I think, like 40 on them um and, and like got a win in Sacramento. But yeah, I think like what they do to our guards, and we're gonna get into our guards now, I'm sure, but like yeah. the once the intensity like goes up a notch, um a lot some of our guys just kind of can't reach that that intensity so like bring it on set this up set up uh this uh d -Lo and uh however this conversation you want you want to go up go about yeah this. yeah let me I, I should actually probably pull up I, I should have been doing this while uh while you were talking but it, i'm gonna pull this up anyways because um i think it's i think it's important material for uh, us to be able to reference so you, we're gonna get into the d -Lo thing now um for the folks that are just joining us um you know we talked about ad we talked about braun um you know it, it is what it is but this article came out today again uh you know we were talking in the group chat trying to figure out what the timing was like why why did this get released like so randomly like it didn't feel like there was anything go kind of going on right off the heels of a really great game against the bucks without lebron that we won that i'm sure a lot of like you know probably some laker fans thought that that you know we we, we didn't really have a chance of winning without braun dilo has a standout game and i don't know what it was, you know, it might just be the author, McMenamin, just feeling that this is the right time to write it. Um, but we get this article that drops, and it's basically D'Lo talking about, um, you know, that it's framed, or, or at least the, the part that Lakers Twitter latched onto was D'Lo being this, like, um, what's the right term? Like, being this, like, rebellious player in the locker room challenging Darvin Ham. And we know that all season long, Darvin Ham has not been the favorite, right? Like, he has been very clearly the the person that's taking the blame for everything like literally the antagonist everything yes is, is darvin ham's fault right, right. and uh, it's gotten so far raj and you said it very nicely um i i walk the bridge with those people <laughs> in my comment section a little bit more yeah. you won't even yeah. approach the bridge you'll say you know what you can cross that bridge yourself yeah go ahead and that's the nice way you're saying it i but see I, the wander under gotten, it i see the water yeah. under it man i, I see <laughs> It's, it's gotten to the point dude where like people are telling me um that there's like this mental burden of like like after this article today like i've had people tell me like there's like this mental burden that like lebron ad and all the players on the roster are carrying because of darvin ham and like they can't always step up their game or, or or play up to their you know to what they're capable of because of it and i'm like what is like so so first and foremost I'm trying to figure out what is going on. Like, like what, what are, what are we talking about? Because there is like empirical evidence in the data. There is literally data that says that this team plays down to its competition. The worse the team they play against, the less defense they play against that team against really good teams. And I think uh, Alex Regla, he's a, he's a, he, I think he works with SSR, a friend of yours and mine. Mm -hmm. he put out a nice stat and we've, we've discussed this before on the pod a few times. Like if you take the NBA and split it into thirds, the top 10 middle 10 and the bottom 10 teams, the Lakers play up to the standard of top 10 teams. They're actually like a, a, a top 10 caliber yeah, team good against record. other top 10 teams um, against the bottom 10 teams. They play zero defense. They're just trying to outscore that team because they don't want to play defense. The wizards game is a perfect example of what that is, but the middle teams, the Lakers actually have a losing record to those teams. And those middle teams are teams like Sacramento. Like Sacramento is technically considered a middle 10 team because they're like the seventh seed or the eighth seed. And the Lakers don't get up for those games. And they're, they're just constantly losing those games because, because of that reason. So this article comes out and it's all about Ham, Ham's coaching and, you know, how D'Lo has stepped up in this role and, he didn't take very well to the benching that he that that happened to him and that sort of stuff. And um, it, there's a lot of opinions, you know, a lot of stuff got shared on the timeline yeah. because of it. Um, and then he kind of has a not good game. Like he doesn't have a good game today. Doesn't have a standout game. Doesn't even have an average game. Doesn't have an, any sort of game. And I, like I said, like if I wanted to be a troll, I could just make fun of the fact that he is a no show in probably what is the most important game of the season um for not important but one of the more important games of the season for for standing sake but i want the team to win so i don't even know how to like what to make of this article like yeah like, I, you you tell me you read it what, what did you think of like what, what was written in it so can i 
Can I say how this how these quotes were transcribed? Like in my opinion, this is what's happened. So I was at the D Lo Masterclass game. Um yeah. he played when they you know played Milwaukee. Obviously, LeBron didn't play. LeBron D Lo had the crowd eating out of his hands. I mean, like yeah. crowd absolutely in his control. Um D Lo could have said anything and the crowd would have followed. Like he he had them drop 44 game winning floater. Um, I believe that game was also on ESPN. So I'm sure like D Lo was feeling good and uh just went in. You know how you know there was I'm I'm sure there was a lot of a release after that game and I think that's how we got these quotes. I'm not saying he doesn't feel this way. I just think that's how we kind of got these. After I don't think it's a coincidence after Delos, in my opinion, his best game of his career. Like he dominated that game, start to finish. Yeah. yeah, picked on Dame and Malik Beasley, um, which again aren't guards that can really ball pressure you or make give you get you yeah. very uncomfortable. Um, and I thought like after that, that's probably when these quotes came. Now. I just like when my issue with this and I'm, I disagree with you in a little bit. I, I know I saw you post that, you know, they should have traded D'Lo and I've kind of been more on the camp of, I would rather have kept D'Lo because I think like mm -hmm. what you're getting for, I just didn't think you were going to get a player that would come back that has his ceiling, let alone his floor. Um, and we can kind of go back and forth in terms of what was available. And we kind of know the players that were on the market and yada, yada, but anyway, D'Lo's yeah. here and like it, it, he's on the team. The, the strange thing about the like the Dennis stuff is really strange to me and it's disappointing because I I think both players were needed like in terms of that run I think there were specific matchups like D'Lo yeah. could not guard John Morant so there were moments where Dennis had to play to guard John Morant um there were, you know plays in the second round that we had Dennis guarding Steph Curry because that's a matchup we liked and so we weren't going to play and we weren't going to play Austin Dennis and D'Lo together throughout the game so I thought there was like ways those two kind of compliment each other i get it from delo's perspective like you bench me for a minimum player um i was making 30 million dollars a year or whatever <clears throat> last year but the idea that like dennis killed darvin and delo's relationship is just it's it's a very strange kind of way to to put that right like the the idea that it's not like delo didn't have bad games in the first two rounds either he did he also had good games does that mean that their relationship was in flux then as well or did it just start in the conference finals or like where like there's got to be some middle ground there and i thought that was really strangely labeled um and the way that it was written was kind of delo was saying it's either me or dennis and the way that right. dave framed it was dennis side with toronto and then the next day delo upped with the lakers so that was kind of how it was worded in the article. Just a lot of strange kind of moments there. But the film room one, let's start there, I guess. Like, what? Yeah. He said that he came to the team and LeBron was the only one talking in film sessions. And D'Lo said, What the, what the F is going on here? And then he took it on himself to challenge. I mean, I buy that D'Lo is very vocal, and I'm sure a guy like D'Lo is very confrontational at times because, like, he probably thinks the game in a similar way that a, coach does and i'm sure they kind of clash in terms of um what they want my thing today is i want my coach and my point guard to clash sometimes like i i want them to spit ideas at each other and have like confrontations on terms of what you should run i don't think that's a negative story is it like is that a negative no. point to the story i i no, think no, that's no. something that you know i would ask for but it's being presented as darvin ham is a terrible coach and that's kind of oh, the yeah backdrop of this whole article so um but yeah, yeah talking no. on just i guess the beginning of that the article in terms of setting up kind of delo's entrance and his initial i guess confrontations um confrontations with him yeah no i mean it's it's clearly the way that this is framed is is they start off talking about you know just kind of delo and how his arrival was like this thing like this uh this mana for that that like just kind of increased like everything that the Lakers are doing, um, which to, it's just fair to some degree, like uh, his shooting did help his playmaking did help. Like, but also adding a guy like Vando also really helped too as well. Cause we needed a guy who could play defense on wings and stuff like that. So I understand that part again, a, to a, a player talking to a coach going back and forth with him, especially when he plays the lead guard, lead ball handler position is a very normal thing. But the thing is, is that I think our fan base is hyper fixated on somebody being smarter than him. If if the fans in the fan base can't, aren't allowed to be smarter than him, then somebody within the front office has to be smarter than him or somebody on the team must be smarter than him. And normally it would be Braun. Like it, it would always be like, oh, Braun is the one who's coaching this team. Braun is the one who's telling these guys where they have to be. 
But that has taken like that angle has sort of taken like a hit because Braun was openly defending Darvin Ham too as well. Like he was on IG saying, "No, this is not what Darvin Ham told me to do. Like I was just doing this." Or you know, like he's actually defending the coach. So since that's happened, that hit this that like it's kind of like slowed down that Braun is the one who's pushing for you know a better coach than Ham. So now Delo is now entered. He's taking kind of that mantle. Like now he's the guy who's openly challenging Ham and stuff like that. I, I want to bring something up. You you said it. I agree with you that the way that this got framed as it's it's Dennis or me, and Dennis is the is the thing that's stopping me from having a relationship with my coach. That seems like that doesn't seem fair at all to to say, especially sixty games into the season, like when you haven't been traded, and now you're saying that your coach didn't have your back, and and even to take it one step back further, the premise is, is that that relationship was strained because D'Lo got benched in game four of the Western conference finals. When we were down Oh three at that point, anybody who watched that series with any sort of like level of detail, D'Lo was getting overwhelmed, not on the, not only on the defensive end, but on the offensive end too, as well. He was having issues oh, yeah. with Bruce Brown. He was having issues with KCP defending him. He wasn't having a good series. So this thing that like Darvin Ham was waiting to bench him, like looking for the opportunity to bench him. I don't think that's, that's a fair way of characterize. I don't think that's grounded. The way I position is I don't think that's grounded in reality. When you're down 0-3, the, the coach is just going to try something. And we know that Dennis worked defensively and stuff like that. The end result didn't change because Denver's just a really good team. Jokic was hitting those fadeaway. I think he hit like that 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 crazy fadeaway three over AD or something like that. That's the game. Game four is the one where AD just like slumps his shoulders. It's like, what do you do against that if he's making those shots? Yeah. And it did change the end result. But I don't think there was any maliciousness from Darvin Ham in, in benching Dilo when he made that move. It's just he had to try something, right? Like we move Vando out of the lineup, we play Rui instead. It, it, it's it's but the part that bothers me a lot, Raj, is that. He went into the exit interview and said, I don't know if I want to come back here. And I was like, we just had an amazing run into the Western Conference Finals from an improbable seed and, and, and trade deadline and stuff like that. And over the strength of you getting benched the very last game of, of, of the playoffs where, you know, we're pretty much overwhelmed and he's, he's trying anything desperate. That's enough of a reason for you to not want to come back and play with Anthony Davis and LeBron James and run it back, right? Right, so to, right. For me, there's obviously there's a the, the salary cap reason is really the main reason why I said that they should have traded him. It has less to do with his basketball, but more more to do salary cap. But the second reason why I think they should have traded him, which I didn't know until this article today, is he didn't want to be there. If the first thing you're saying, or not the first thing, but if you're going into an exit interview saying that you don't know if you want to come back to the Lakers after the run we just had. I don't know what to say to like, if I'm the GM, that's a red flag for me. Am I wrong for thinking that way? Thinking that that's a red flag? No, you would hope a little bit more accountability is taken, right? Like, Hey, I had a, I had an awful series. Like I played terrible. Um, I want to kind of, you know, fix my wrongs and um, play better next year. And he kind of went into that very much in a stone cold way. Like, Hey, why did you bench me? I could have helped you. Did you hear? Did you see that part in the article, Fene, where he's like, "Yeah, I could have helped you help me play better." Like, it's like, man, like we all watched. We watched the series. Like it was, it, it was so, completely not to, removed. And not to interrupt you, yeah, can, can I just bring this part up? We know who our two stars are. Darvin Ham is not worried about scheming up stuff for you to play better. He needs LeBron and AD to play the best that they. And Braun was foot was compromised, so I think he had kind of an up and down series. Like. I, I, honestly, like I, I'm, I'm saying this very respect, as respectfully as I possibly can. We are not drawing up plays for D'Lo in crunch time, unless there's like an obvious mismatch situation where we can we can exploit, like like the Bucks game essentially that we can do. When the ball is at the end of the at the end of the game, we're trying to get LeBron or AD the best shot. That's just how it works in the NBA. And the the fact that he's like, oh, if you had listened to me, we could have gotten me better opportunities. No, you're in, on this team. You are a role player, unless our stars are like, no, you need to give it like, like the Austin thing in the Memphis series. You need to give the ball to Austin because he can win this matchup. 
that sort of thing. And he wasn't having a good series. I, I interrupted you, but I, I just want to bring that up. Oh, no, I, thought, I thought that was crazy for, for him to say, but go ahead. You're yeah. talking about him scheming yeah, no, no, no. to get a better shot. Yeah, no, I'm, well, I was just saying, like, we were watching the series and, like, Denver completely took him out of both sides of the basketball. They put, they picked on him almost every possession. Jamal Murray would call up whoever D'Lo was guarding and put him in a ball screen. And the other side, D'Lo didn't want to touch the basketball. And when he did, he, you know, was terrible. I think he averaged like eight points in that series after averaging like 19 um, during the regular season. I mean, he completely dropped his averages um, in that series. And yeah, I don't, I don't know what they could have schemed. And my, my thing is, Vinay, all those games were close, right? All those games against Denver were close. Mm-hmm. There are hundred percent. There were millions of conversations going on in the in the huddle between LeBron and AD, between LeBron and Austin, between LeBron Austin and D'Lo. I'm sure there were conversations there to like come out with this and you know say, yeah, I could have helped Darvin Ham if he just if his relationship with Dennis just like I'm, I'm gonna put this out here. Every coach has players that they have an affection for. Like this is 100%. not this is not something that's rare to Darvin Ham. Like Frank Vogel had an affection for Avery Bradley and it kind of worked out for him. Avery Bradley, you know, was, we were told by the Clipper fans and Grizzlies fans, Avery Bradley is done. His career is over. You guys are signing him. That's crazy. And he had an affection for him. Maybe Bradley, you know, coined the, um, the Avery Bradley deep, the Avery defense challenge from AD and had a really good season until he decided not to enter the bubble. Um, so every coach to me has some kind of player. And this year, Darwin seems to be Torian Prince, which look, like Torin hasn't been great and it's annoying to watch. There are also worse players for a coach to have an affection kind of for. And at, like it, putting that aside, I just think like that it's a very strange situation to be at to where blaming a player who's no longer on the team, who's been yeah. traded twice since then um, or once since then. I just, I think it's, it's my biggest thing with this Vinay is like, this is a point that I haven't seen made. And again, like I'm not screaming online with it. So maybe it's been made. It just hasn't. Do you love feeling comfortable enough to like, shout this publicly um just doesn't yeah. it doesn't sit right with me for like think about what happened here again like I don't, i'm not attacking d at all i think he's a i think he's probably a super nice guy his podcast is cool he's nice him and ad are obviously very close if you listen if you read the article you you'll learn that him and ad are texting at 2 a.m basketball stuff which yeah great <laughs> but um <laughs> it, it's it's clear that you know they're close but like so this get this comes out, and every single one of these quotes now get brought to LeBron, right? LeBron got asked, like, is your scheme like good enough? You know, like it's like, you know, all these questions get brought to him, and these questions just get kind of surrounded to the locker room. Darvin Ham trying to figure out how to coach like a, a playoff style kind of situation is being asked. How's your relationship with your starting point guard? Like it's just at in yeah. game 60, whatever. I just these quotes being so like I understand if D'Lo wasn't wasn't on the team anymore, you know, and these quotes just started to to fly out. It's understandable. Still being on the team and still being in an active playoff hunt, these quotes coming out publicly, they just don't, they just don't. It just doesn't sit right with me that um he felt so comfortable kind of just releasing this uh releasing this out, which tells me something about the locker room. It tells me something about just his, he feels his places within the locker room to, and I think they all like D'Lo. Like I like you could tell them the celebratory stuff they do, but um, like, I just thought it was strange that he felt so comfortable kind of just releasing this, all this information, um, all this information publicly um, as, as we continue to fight for, for a playoff spot. It's just, it, it's strange, but do you feel that way? Like I just, him being so comfortable releasing this info is it's it's strange it's strange to me. Yeah, I mean, he, I don't think Dilo, I don't think Dilo is um, uh, bashful when he wants to offer his mm-hmm. opinion about certain things. Uh, I, I think sure, sure. He has a lot of self. I think he has a lot of self confidence in, in himself as a basketball player, and he also has a lot of confidence in himself um, as a person you know it just in general and mm-hmm. he's one of the 450 players in the in the world that plays in one of the best leagues in the world so he should have that that confidence about himself i think bron said something really nice um he was they were talking about i think it was about the ad so bonus matchup i forgot what it was but the bron basically said that he's like you're never a loser like when you're one of the 450 best players in the in the world like mm. in the, in this league like you're not you're never a loser or anything. i thought that was a really nice thing that bron said because it kind of like zoomed out the perspective of what it was but back, I mean, back to D'Lo, like, I thought it was bad, honestly. Like, I, I thought this article coming out, these quotes coming out, 
We're up six games. We just had a tremendous win against the Bucs. Um, again, without LeBron, that, that's a huge game. I thought this was a – I don't think the timing was up to D'Lo, but just – I thought it was horrendous. Like, I, I thought it was really bad to follow up a game like – like, follow up a game like that with this quote. And then you have the game that you had tonight. <laughs> so it's just like – obviously, people are going to be dunking on D'Lo. The, the people who don't like him – we're going to dunk on him, whatever, whatever it is that, that it, that's going to happen the way it does. But like there have been instances this season where we have seen the same issue with D'Lo that we saw in, in the Western Conference Finals. When teams get very physical with D'Lo, he has trouble um, scoring. Keon Ellis was being physical with D'Lo today. Like he was attacking his live dribble. He was fighting through screens. He was not giving him easy open shots. And you could tell that D'Lo was thrown off of a rhythm the, the entire game. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen in the playoffs, but we needed to zoom out a little bit for a sec for a second here. I think Laker fans should probably do that. That would be my recommendation. And that recommendation is D'Lo is not being measured based on what he does in the regular season. If anything, I don't think the Lakers oh, care no about what he does in the regular season. Nope. Like him shooting better after the benching, him having the game against the Buck. Like it's great because it leads to wins. We want him to be successful because if he's playing well, that means that we're probably winning the game. But the reality is, is that we want to see him do it in the playoffs and not in the sense of like, we need to see the averages in the scoring. It's very, very specific. Like he doesn't have too much to prove anymore other than he can deal with these types of teams in the playoffs. And I'm not saying, I'm not expecting him to not do it. I, I think he does want to meet that challenge. He openly said that I've studied the tape and I know what I need to do to, to get there. So I'm, I'm, I'm on his side. Like I want him to get there. Cause if, like I said, if he's doing well, we're going to win. But I don't know what this this article accomplishes in that respect. If you're a GM, let's just take Rob Plink out of this. If you're a future GM who thought to yourself for a second that, you know what? D'Lo looks like he's really matured during this Laker tenure. He looks like he's really turned it around. He's playing really well. And this article comes out after he puts 40 up against the Bucks. What GM is going to be like, should I bring this guy back? Or should I should I go and add this guy? Because at any point, even after a win, he might go and do an, you know, give quotes to some local reporter about some issue that he has in the locker room with somebody else. And so it's like that that's my thing. Like I don't know, I don't know what the you know what I mean, like I like I don't understand what what you gained by doing this other than just putting a target on your coach's back. Like what not, this didn't accomplish anything. You're not vindicated, right? Because we we still have to get to the playoffs. And that's where you're going to be judged. So it's just that's my whole that's my whole thing. I, I don't think this article did anything other than just put a bigger target on 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 his coach's back. And again, uh, what is ever what is everybody doing? Everybody's saying, "See, there's a player in the Lakers locker yep. room that doesn't like Darvin Ham and d- didn't like his coaching." And sure, they have a better relationship now, but clearly the players know it, and Genie has to fire him. Okay, all right. Now, yeah. now this is what it's going to be. The, the best part about these long winded articles, right? They're so they're like, I call them multi scrollers where like you got to scroll like five times oh, yeah. to read it. And obviously everybody picks out their favorite, you know, quote from it to, to, to post it and, and comment on this, this article really told you whatever you wanted to hear in my, yeah. like if you didn't like D'Angelo Russell, it's very easy to come away with this far, from this article going, this is why I don't like D'Angelo Russell, right? Because of this, this, and this. If you like D'Angelo Russell and his moxie and his swagger and the and the you talked what you call it rebellious kind of attitude, yeah, you could have been like, look, look at this guy. Like, this is why I believe in him because like he believes he's on the same level as LeBron and AD, right? And then I'm I'm a D'Lo fan for sure. I but I honestly didn't like the timing of this either. My favorite thing about this article, Louis Benet, is um, uh, D'Lo and Spencer Dinwiddie are good friends. Like they're close. Yeah, it's it's clear, right? And so D'Lo's like, yeah, I can't believe. Darvin Ham loves Dennis Schroeder so much to close with me. Like, do you know why Spencer Dinwiddie's here? Like, do you, do you, do you, do you, uh, can I, can I give you the quote? Can I give, uh, can I give you the, can I give you the quote? Oh, I'm going to finish, finish with that. I want to, I'm going to give you this. No, no, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. Tell you, go, go ahead. Put the quote. Put the okay. Quote. There is a quote that D'Lo says in this and let me, I, I'm scrolling to find it. So let me find it. Oh, okay. I, here, here is the quote. This was after the after McMenamin explains how the negotiation went, like why he took the one plus one versus mm-hmm. versus what it was, right? So I, I I could do like an hour on the salary cap implication, not the salary cap implications, but like what 
just off of those four paragraphs or four things that that section, I could do an hour about about how that game played out, how that conversation played out between D'Lo and and uh, and Rob and and Ham or whoever mm. else was in the conversation with him. So we'll say that for another time because I, that is so funny to read. But there's he ends ends this section by saying this, right? He he talked about you know getting an opt out and stuff like that for the contract, and D'Lo can explore free agency again, possibly get himself a higher number, whatever it is. And then he says at the end of it, right? It, it says this. It says waiving that no trade clause was the compromise. If both sides needed a change, Russell wouldn't block it. And then this is the quote that D'Lo says. D'Lo says, because I mean. I'm a point guard for the Lakers. All there has to be is another point guard that wants to be here, Russell said. And that's something that the Lakers are capable of doing. Not a, not every organization is. And yeah, I thought about yeah. that quote for a second. And I said, hmm, I wonder if Rob Polinka told Spencer Dinwiddie that if Dio leaves this offseason, for whatever reason, if he leaves, that there's probably going to be a vacancy for that point guard spot on the Los Angeles Lakers. And if he sits tight just long enough and things don't go the way that they think they're going to go, he's probably a great, you know, probably has some sort of future here with the Lakers or something like that. And I thought it was so funny that that quote got, got um, my cameras randomly zooming in into my face <laughs> because of my hand gestures. But um, I thought it was so funny that that quote got inserted in right at the end of his contract negotiations, because it's very, very possible that something like that can possibly happen. Like deal opts yeah. out maybe and finds a team or maybe he opts in and the Lakers trade him if, if, if he wants a better destination that, you know, for a specific type of money or a specific type of role and Spencer Dinwiddie, mm -hmm. his friend gets to fill in, fill in the seats for him. Maybe not in exactly the same capacity, but in a somewhat capacity, but I interrupted you. Talk to me about, but yeah. you were, you were talking about the friendship that those two have with each other. Yeah, well, no, I just thought it was funny that like is he has some. It's clear there's some animosity between him and Dennis, and because of the love triangle yeah. that Darwin somehow has created uh, between all of them. Uh, but I was like, yeah, this is this is why Spencer Dinwiddie is here. I mean, this is <laughs> we didn't just go get a fourth guard for no. Gabe Vincent is returning, right? Yeah, there's a reason. It's the big reason. There's a reason Gabe Vincent's here, right? You think Gabe yeah. Vincent just came to play three guard lineups with you, Austin and? You know, and himself? No, like Gabe Vincent is also here to like play that Dennis Schroeder role. So it, it's it's strange to kind of put that all on Dennis Schroeder. And Gabe Vincent was closing games. Um, I think Gabe Vincent closed over Austin a few of those games to start as well. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's just it's it's um it's very strange, man. And like, I, not to play like Devils or to play Delo's advocate here. Like, I, from Delo's yeah. perspective, like Vinay, I would totally understand if he was just like f y'all. Like, I've been traded what five times in my career yeah. every every time i put my feet in the sand and get a tiny bit comfortable someone ships me off somewhere <laughs> minnesota told me i was theirs right minnesota was like d -Lo, you're our point guard you're best friends with carl anthony towns like we want to build with you and uh right away you kicked me off when mike conley became available golden state you told me me and staff are going to be a fire backcourt and then you shipped me off to minnesota Brooklyn, you told me like Brooklyn, you were like, we're gonna build together. I, I took you to the playoffs. I made the all-star game. Um, and you shipped me right once Kevin Durant said he wanted to come. So I would understand if D'Lo has a little bit of an F U attitude, right? In terms of like against GMs, against of coaches, against of whoever, in terms of like who do I believe. Um, but even saying all that, like I just I think there has to be some thought process of just how it looks and the accountability of what happened last year. And to continue to kick it on other people, or remember in the uh, I remember in the exit interview they asked Dilo, "Hey Dilo, like you got a really tough close to the season. Like, what are you gonna work on?" Now, honestly, nothing. Like, I'm good right. with what the player I am, and like even if that's what you believe, and I'm sure a lot of players go into the summer thinking, "I'm good. I can make my my contract's gonna continue at this number at the pace that I play at." Um, but that's not, those are words that you just don't want to hear. And I think you appreciate Dilo for being candid. We also would like a little bit of him to kind of stretch and um, not stretch the truth, but at least show some accountability of what happened. And maybe this is just who Dilo is. We'll see what happens in the playoffs. Um, but I think this has been the consistent theme where like ball pressure gets to him. And yeah. this is why like these quotes just can't. He had some quotes last year too, but I forgot during the close of the season. I forgot what it was about, but um. 
some kind of putting the cart before the horse type of stuff. And then he had like a really tough close to the season. Obviously he was out for like two weeks with an ankle injury. Strangely, like it was like, there's some strange things going on with him, but um, like, to be fair, he's had a good season. Like he's scoring well, he's carried, he's helped carry the team through a tough start to the year. Got benched early back in the lineup, lineup situations. He's starting to shoot better, but um, you can't have these quotes come out and then uh go over eight or whatever he was tonight or one per nine from the field. And it's just his floor has to be higher. And I think, like you said, the Lakers don't care about what he does in the regular season. I think the whole league is this way with D'Lo. Like it's just the whole league has has gotten got to a point where like we need to see it in the playoffs. We need to see it executed. We need to see the same guy in the playoffs in big games um, come through and. We'll see if he does. I think he had a better playoffs than he gets credit for last year, but uh, the conference finals were what they were. And I think continuing to kind of shy away from that is what got fans the most pissed off is the continuing to kind of leverage it on someone else. Like to your point, what was the point of this article? What did I learn? I, I'm not sure what I learned from this. I, what I got from this was him and AD text at 1 a.m. about basketball. And that's, be- that's cool. That's yeah. cool. Like that's great. Um, I don't, I don't know what else. The and, and the challenge that of, he was having second Gar- thoughts while playing on this team. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that he wasn't gonna come unless they didn't resign Dennis Schroeder, which I mean unless, unless they didn't let Dennis Schroeder walk, which is it's it's strange. It's a it's a really strange guy to kind of point the finger at um sixty games after he's not on the team. So I I don't know what, what else I like got from this. And again, I think this was a very easy like uh, the like the aim is at D'Lo, but you're actually staring at Darwin Ham type of article where like, you read through it, right? It's a very much a kind of Darwin Ham hit um, rather than like a D'Lo expose. But uh, yeah, I just I I don't think we needed this now. And I'm sure if you gave LeBron truth serum, he's like, what the f? Like, what, what are you what are you doing? Like, yeah. I'm the only one who talks to Dave. No, I'm just kidding. But like, <laughs> <laughs> like. But like it's just it's it's strange for this to come out now, man. I just I just don't get it. Yeah, yeah, understand. and it, and I mean, it, it, like I said, like it, it also contextualizes this conversation. Also contextualizes um, why the Lakers were interested in Dejounte Murray. Like why the Lakers are now interested in Trey Young. Like obviously they think something about those two players that they don't think that they can get out of D'Lo. And if this was the sentiment. Not not the hand D'Lo thing, but like the the sentiment at his exit interview, or the sentiment that he had for Dennis, or or whatever it was. I I feel like he probably didn't tell them, the front office, like oh it's either Dennis or me. I feel like it wasn't presented that way, but I think there's a version of this where it was presented. I, I but I do think that there's a part of it where he openly said, I think the in the in the in the article it says, are you going to let me rock out? Which again, Roger, <laughs> I cannot point out the irony of yet another Russell. Going into an exit interview and saying, "You guys didn't let me be me." Okay, I don't think that that irony hasn't fallen like hasn't dawned on me. We literally had another point card the previous year say the exact, on nearly the exact same sentiment um, when when he left. But you know, we don't want to revisit the, that area because then, then my mentions get really messy uh, afterwards. But Delo says exactly the same thing, and I think all all. The only thing that this article did was contextualize some more of what the separation was. You and I in the offseason said that the best thing that the Lakers could do, like if the Lakers, first and foremost, you, you and I both said, you have to bring D'Lo back. He's still a, a talented basketball player. No reason for us to just let him off for no reason. But um, like it has to be at a number that makes sense. It can't be a number that, that puts us into the second apron or, or whatever it is. Just the complications of, of what the salary cap is. Like we can't go in that direction. So if we get him at like 20 million to 25 million, that's that's a pretty acceptable number for for a guy of this caliber. Lakers did even better. They got him at like 18 million. I think D'Lo is not happy with that. I don't think D'Lo thinks he's an 18 million dollar player. I think he probably feels like he can get somewhere between 25 and 30 million. Again, we could cover talk about this for an hour. I don't think that's what D'Lo's market is. I don't think there's somebody out there that wants to pay him 30 million dollars a year. He is who he is. You know what I mean? Like we, everybody knows what type of player he is. There's no shocking. He openly has said that I'm not going to work on anything new. I, I am who I am. Like he's more or less said that to as well. So it's just like, 
there's a little bit of, okay, you're acknowledging what's in front of you in the mirror. So there has to be a little bit of realism when it comes to what your expectations are salary wise. Now, I don't know how that's going to work out in the off season. So my, again, to just reinforce what I was saying, the reason why I thought they should have traded him was because you weren't planning on keeping him. And if you're still not planning on keeping him, now you're in a situation where you have to hope he opts in so you can use his salary to move him. He's not under any obligation to, to stay with the Lakers if he has a better deal somewhere else. His agent's going to try and get him a better deal somewhere else. And now this article comes out and it says that he didn't really feel like being there in the first place because of politics on the back end. And I'm like, dude, this, this is terrible. So, you know, it is what it is. We can't do anything about it now. We got the engagement that they wanted. Everybody hates him yet again. Um, you know, just, just reinforces it some more. And, and now we'll last, see what happens, dude. Well, last part of this article, which I think just got glossed over um, yeah. because obviously there was just all the other stuff. He said when he got here, he told Rob Polinka this team is shit. But I read that correctly, right? I just I read that four times, and I'm still unsure I read that properly. He told Rob Polinka, "We're not shit," but then we just we just started winning. What? That? But those weren't the. That's not at all the quotes that came out. D'Lo when he got here said, "We have a good team. This is easy with LeBron and AD. Like we're like." I thought that was extremely strange the way that was worded. Um, I, 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 think, I, read- I think I think D'Lo understands the business side of basketball really well. And I think he is very smart. And it does not shock me. It does not shock me that he knows what to say in front of a camera and he knows what to say behind the camera. And I feel like part of the reason why he went into that exit interview and said, are you guys going to let me rock out? Like, I don't know if I want to be here was him probably exercising a little bit of power and saying, I know the kind of season that we ended with. And I know what my impact was on that season. Are you guys going to pay me and let me be me and, and uh, you know, give me the leeway that I want as a player or do I have to go somewhere else? And I think that's still, that's going to be a game of chicken that they're going to have to figure out uh, this off season too as well. Yeah. I just, I, just, I just thought that I'm reading it again. I just can't believe that's a quote that made it in this story. Yeah. I told him we weren't shit, but we complimented each other and we started winning. Like what? I, I, so it was an accident or like that? That's the part that just that just doesn't. But um, but hey, last, last question for you because I don't know what's going on here. Let's say the Lakers get the 9-10 spot. They lose to Golden State in Golden State. So they don't okay. make the playoffs. D'Lo continues his trajectory of good game here, bad game here, good game here, hot game, 40-point game, 10-point. He had 13 against Minnesota, by the way, which just no one remembers because we won that game. But, like, it, again, like, it's just this up-and-down nature. What's his market? Like, is is he a $20 million player uh, just of what he's shown in this regular season? If if people get no playoff video from it, is, he, is that what he is? Or... Has he kind of played baseline? I just I have no idea how to correctly evaluate D'Angelo Russell's market. I, I have no clue. Um, okay, so so uh, for to to cover it like very quickly, the two things that D'Lo's agent is looking for is one a team that'll offer him enough money, even if it's for a single season, that's enough to get him to leave the Lakers, right? So if he's his his player option for next year with the Lakers is eighteen million dollars. So if somebody mm-hmm. offers him, is $20 million enough for D'Lo to leave? Is $25 million enough? Is $30 million enough? We don't know what the answer to that question is. It can be a single year or it could be multiple years. We never know what that is. Um, is there a team that's willing to do that? I don't think there is a team that's willing to do that. One of the – every year there's always good point guards coming into the league or good guards coming into the league. And I don't know too many teams that are ready to fork over 25 to $30 million for a player of D'Lo's caliber. Not to say he's not a good player, but just allocating that much of your salary cap to a player like that is a little bit difficult uh, if you have open. Does that mean the team won't do it? I don't know. But there might be a team that's out there that's like, you know what, we have cap space, we're going to do it. We just saw the Rockets give Fred Van Vliet like $40 right. million or something crazy. So so that, that's entirely possible. All it takes is one team for, for a team to do that. But even if you do – so that that's one list of teams. I don't think that there's very many teams that want to do that. Then the second list of teams are teams that think he's the missing piece to a championship, like the missing part to a championship. And that's, again, like 
you're talking about who you're playing with. You're playing with LeBron in AD. You were heralded as a guy who was like the antithesis to Russell Westbrook and a perfect compliment. And if you can't succeed with them, then then what does that say also too as well? So it's it's I don't know if his market is is going to be that. Like I don't know if I don't know if his market gets significantly better. I think his market is somewhere between twenty and twenty five million dollars. But even that is like a limited, including with with the Lakers too as well. I think his his range is a little limited. So I mean I I don't, I don't know. You know, like, but you never know. His his agent can find somebody, and this could be a moot conversation, and you know, he, he ends up leaving. But that's a real gamble that he's taking too, as well. Like by putting this article out, you've also basically said you're not necessarily on board with him, like uh, as the coach. And the Lakers will have to make that decision. And I don't know if the Lakers are going to side with D'Lo um, when it comes to this, because again, folks. We have our two stars on this team. LeBron and AD are the stars. So Dilo's opinion of Darvin Ham may not matter as much as people think. It's really LeBron and AD's opinion of Darvin Ham that, that really matters. And so that, that that's the way that I kind of approach it. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I, I just think it's fascinating. Like um, Dilo's a very like, interesting player. He's very polarizing. Like you either really like Dilo or you really don't. His game kind of offers you a baseline to go either way. You could yeah. hate him, you can like him, you can hate the shots he takes, or you can just be like D'Lo is a player. Like usually, there's players way better than D'Lo Vinay that don't have the stands that he does. Like D'Lo has a legit stand base, which I, I think is is interesting, right? And I think that just I'm not attacking stand culture. I, just, I think it just shows the type of game that he has, where yeah. um, it's very Paul Georgie, right? Where like you can kind of see what you want from like Paul, like. You could either you could either see Paul George as the most skilled freaking basketball player ever, or you can look at Paul George like, why do you shoot four times in the fourth quarter? Like, yeah, like you know, you can either look at him either way, and you can do the same with kind of obviously Delo's not in Paul George's tier of, of basketball player. I'm just comparing them as aesthetic players who who are enjoyable to watch when they're on. But I think like it's interesting to look at what his market is. That the Darvin Ham stuff, I don't know, but but hey, this team looks like it's gonna live in that nine ten seed and. They're either gonna go on the road to Golden State, or they're gonna have Steph Curry in a one-off game, like yeah, to get in the so playoffs. I, yeah, I think I think Golden State lost today, so I don't think we lost any ground, uh, at least in regards to right. that. So we're fortunate mm-hmm. in that sense. I mean, if we get lucky, we might be able to sneak in as like the eight seed and get two chances and at least get one home game in the play-in. I, I just. I just I don't even I don't like our chances against like if we have to play Sacramento. If Sacramento mm-hmm. ends up a seventh or eighth seed, we're gonna have to play them. And we have not beaten them. Like four games in a row, we've lost exactly the same way. And I don't see any reason, you know, barring any injuries for Sacramento to not beat on us again. You know, like unless LeBron has an incredible game and AD has like, you know, an, an incredible game against Sabonis. So uh we're not helping ourselves out by dropping these games, but there's still what, fifteen games left? Fourteen games left? Which is- which is not a lot. I mean, you yeah. assume that like Run and AD aren't going to play 15 straight. Like, I just would not assume yeah. that. Um, and our schedule I think is not easy. I and mean, we have some winnable games coming up here. But um, like you said, in terms of our like energy level against these bottom feeder teams, we have some middle ground to bottom feeder teams. And then, by the way, Denver's the one seed. So like 9 10 is guaranteed. The only guarantee is an eighth seed. If you get in, you get Denver round one. It's just yeah, um, the bracket's not really moving up. I mean, it's still fifteen games, and you know Denver and OKC are both tied in the loss column. Looks like um, the Clippers are out from the one seed for their losses. And then, did you see Kawhi just leave the game, Vinay? Like end of the first quarter. Uh, that's very strange. But um, see what happens with them. But uh. Yeah, this team just looks like it's going to fall into a 9-10 spot, and they're lucky that Houston and Utah and all those teams are kind of way far back, so they don't have to really worry about not having a playing game. But I don't trust this team to go on the road to Dallas. Do you trust them to go on the road to Dallas and win a playing game? I, I don't. Playing Luka and Kyrie in a one-off. I'm still, I'm like still, I, I still, a part of me still holds on to the fact that we won that IST against Indiana, and Indiana's a really, really good team. 
um, and that they can lock in. <laughs> like, I mean, cause we've seen them do it. it. I know it's annoying and we keep, I know like we always bring it up and that, you know, that's part of the Homerism or delusionalism that, that we have sure. um, as, as Laker fans, like we've seen them lock in for a single game um, and how dominant this team can be. I think Braun has said it pretty well. They can beat any team on a given night. So do I think they can win a one game playoff against, you know, uh, some team in the plan? Yeah. Do I think it's 50, 50? No, I think the style of play that the other team plays influences a lot of, of how successful we will be. Um, but you know, there is a version of this team that, that is, that is really, really good. And so at least for that one game or the, the couple games that we play, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I, I don't want to, as we get closer to figuring out just kind of what their seating will actually be, we'll probably be able to give better analysis in regards to it. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's great, t- great Bucks game, D- bad, bad Kings game. What, what, what do we do? Yeah. I don't know where we go from here. We got another game in two days. We got to lock well, in for that. We'll close, we'll close with this, I guess. D'Lo was asked, what has, what has made the Kings such a difficult matchup for the Lakers? Mike Brown, according to D'Lo. I know how good of a coach he is. I know he's done to that team. <laughs> he just got what? Well, anyways, let's not. We've already talked about him so much. Yeah, <laughs> it's just not. I, I don't feel like talking about his lack of accountability. It's okay. Oh, you know, it, it is what it is. Some players do it. Some players don't. Um, yeah, that's just what it is. And uh, Lakers got it. You know, we don't play the Sacramento. We don't play Sacramento anymore. So Laker fans can you know, be relieved that we don't Thank have to play, God. but we've got other games. We got to take care of the games in front of them. So hopefully the Lakers do that. And me and Raj will catch you in, you know, whatever the next stream is. So for the folks yeah. that joined us from the start or joined in midway through, this will get reposted or this will get posted on Spotify and Apple. Um, it will be on YouTube, I think too, as well already, because it's a live stream. So it should be in the live section. Um, but, you know, as always for the folks that support Lakers detail, like, share, subscribe, whatever it is that you do, we appreciate you. And, and regardless of whenever you're listening to this during the day or during the evening, we hope you have a wonderful day. And if nothing else, we'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.